Welcome back to Business Week here on Arise News. As we end a year with a war in Europe and an associated energy crisis and high inflation, which have roiled markets and slowed the economy, the early signs of easing of some of these pressures provided hope that credit conditions could stabilize in 2023. But corporations around the world are facing a triple threat of declining demand, persistently higher costs and investors' increased risk aversion. As consumer credit conditions worsen, this will ultimately impact those who provide goods and services as they themselves grapple with tight financing conditions on top of declining consumer demand. The role and impact of credit in driving growth and helping businesses scale is well known, and financial sector stability can hinge on how well regulators and lenders manage the issuance and administration of consumer or corporate loans and even trade credit. Well, joining me to discuss these trends, risks, and the outlook for the credit economy and management is the registrar and CEO of the National Institute of Credit Administration, Nigeria, Professor Chris Onalo. Fondly referred to sometimes as Mr. Credit due to his long-running and stellar track record, he's also the director of the prestigious London Postgraduate Credit Management College in the UK and the first African to be appointed Professor of Credit Management by an international university. Thanks so much for joining me, Professor Onalo. So Great much. to have you. So Thank you. I guess in many people's minds, you know, we all know that credit is built on trust. Um, and I guess a, a big question for you, which is a trend we see here, is why have many Nigerian businesses struggled in their credit obligations? Well, thank you so much. Um, the credit Failure, you know, is not peculiar to Nigeria. Credit failure is in all clients, but then it is the strength of the economy. Back home in Nigeria here, people default in credit, not because they want to do so. At least a very uh, minute percentage of the people could deliberately, you know, go along the line uh, to defaulting in credit. But uh, ultimately, the condition of the economy uh, is the first copy it. You know, uh, the, the, the country need to look at how the economic condition can be stabilized and making it much more uh, friendly for people in business, people in different cadre of credit to be able to uh, seize that moment of a very comfortable uh, business climate to be able to honor obligation. But <clears throat> in recent time, we have come to realize that uh, some people really misunderstood credit to mean something very personal, something they could take and get away with it. Especially when you look at uh, sectors like financial services sector, uh, there's a huge amount of loan default in there. And this loan default is, you can, can be traced to a very few number of people you know, in the country. Compared Do we even to, know what that rate of default is? Is well, there a figure around the rate well, of default? Well, according to the Asset Management Corporation, you know, uh, about 300 people uh, 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 seems to be in, in holding firmly, tightly, a large chunk of amount that is considered to be uh, failed credit. You know, these people ostensibly uh, are not inclining to pay back. And when you look at the entire population of people in business, and you come to see only 300 people are holding largest chunk of amount of money, you know, that is, is, is held down away from business use, then you begin to think that there seems to be a way people understood credit, you know. So uh, going along that line, I think um, the credit default in financial services is not too alarming, you know, when compared with the number of people that want to get credit from the financial service sector. And then you look at the trade credit, uh, that hasn't been really reported by organized private sectors like Manufacturer Association of Nigeria, uh, Nas uh, N N the NASIMA, there's is, there is a long name there, and some other pockets of uh, trade associations, chambers of commerce and all that. Yeah, if by the time that statistics come to the public uh, uh, you know, knowledge, it, it, will, it will surprise everyone mm -hmm. that the trade credit failure, business to business credit failure, is still alarming. And let me quickly add to this. The distributors, I think that's the name that they are popularly called, distributors of uh, products that are produced in the country or distributors of products that are imported into the country, uh, sometimes are trusted with goods sell, you know, in view of long-standing relationship between those distributors and, and uh, the sellers of those products. 
and that they could cut away with these schools and never to come back to pay, maybe on a 30 day stems, as usually agreed, sell it on the 30th day, come and pay. And most time you don't see some of these distributors coming back to pay. Then the reason for all of that default, which is your main question, it could be some disasters could have happened, you know, some what we call in five C's of credit, it's what we call five C's of credit. And they are capital, character, collateral, uh, circumstances and condition. Now, one condition could occur or circumstance could occur and totally enrolled the plan for repayment, you know. And, and that is a genuine credit default. And when that happened, the two sides understand why the mm. customer is not able to come back to pay. Yeah. But on the other hand, we have circumstances like uh, the legal system in the country may contribute to credit failure. And that is what really is a frightening situation in the country. The, the legal system is not helping matters. And as well as uh, the, some macroeconomic policy of the government, you know, suddenly overnight you could see people finding themselves uh, grappling with uh, the consequence of the government policies and all that. And if that stayed a little longer, it could affect yeah. the obligations that the two parties have raised. So there are a lot there of... There are lots of factors, yeah, obviously, I, involved. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about the private sector. It's obviously sometimes quite difficult to capture trade that occurs, especially for private companies. So many of these defaults may not even be recorded. But there's one issue of defaulting on credit. There's another very pertinent issue, which is access to credit. Um, access to credit for the private sector, particularly for SMEs, is still quite low. What are some of the, I guess, the, the initiatives or the challenges that companies still face with credit access? And what are some of the solutions that can be provided to improve the rates of access to credit? Yeah, OK. The, I, I think the government and uh, organized private sectors has not been able to come to terms in, 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 by way of uh, what is the lasting solution that should be uh, provided by the government, supported by private sectors, to see that there is a free flow of credit to the real sector, small and medium scale enterprises. I'll give you an, a figure. Last year, no, this, by, by 30th of November, this past November, about 64.41 trillion naira was moved from the lending sector to the economy. <clears throat> and of this In amount, the form of loans? In, in the form of loan. Okay. okay. Because, you know, of course, we are talking about access to credit by the SMEs. Basically, we'll be looking at the financial services sector. Yes, there'll be trade relations and the business to business, you know, kind of credit between the suppliers and the vendors. But that is on one side. The 22 point something trillion went to the federal government and state government. And then we have 45 point something trillion that goes to the private sector. That's where I'm going. Now, of this huge amount, what percentage of it goes to the SME? Almost extremely insignificant. And so SMEs are still left, you know, out of the scheme of the economy. But if we continue to do that, we are not going to be able to quickly generate jobs at the world, which the government and the people are clamoring for. What is done in other climb, and we have been suggesting that for a very long time to the government that look here, what we can do is not just having pockets of credit guarantee schemes that you have put in place which will encourage banks you know, to lend to the SMEs. And when default comes, the banks will don't have much problem quickly tender the certificate of guarantee and go to the guarantee scheme and ask for the money within a twinkling of an eye. Mm. We don't have that kind of system. Agricultural credit guarantee system is sectorial. And then some other pockets like that are sectorial. Uh, we are looking at a holistic kind of scheme that is extremely big in size, big in capital base, operating a fund and attractive to the lenders themselves. Because banks are under regulation. Central bank anywhere in the world insist that no bank should be allowed to lend any money out without collateral security backing it up. And that's what we don't have uh, in the case of Nigerian SMEs. In fact, SMEs all over the world, they suffer the same fate. What the government need to do, and I think government should 
cannot run away from that anymore, is to set up a national credit guarantee corporation as giant as that of the South Korea. South Korea has passed through where we are. China has passed through where we are. And so we can use their model to revamp in the economy on a sustainable basis. And, and this credit guarantee corporation would be guaranteeing loans specifically to SMEs or now, creating a structure for those SMEs to be now, credit worthy. This is how it, it, it is functioned. If you set up a credit guarantee corporation, having the full faith and the strength of the federal government, of course, by the size of the guarantee, no state government can contemplate it. Mm. It's massive. You can talk, okay, I've just read out to you now, figure of 64.22 trillion. Okay, if we take that figure as the capital base for the setting up of the credit guarantee cooperation, now if you have 3 million SMEs in this country, I tell you, in two, three years, you can triple the SMEs. And that means... And help them scale, yeah, obviously. You, yeah. yes. Many more SME institutions will be joining the bank wagon because the operating environment is conducive. Now, when a credit guarantee corporation is set up, the bank looks at the credibility of the credit guarantee corporation. Banks look at the capital base. There are two types of fund there, the setup fund and the claim fund. And the guarantee is structured on high profile risks that if there is any default within 24 hours, the guarantee must settle the banks. Now, if I am an SME and I come to you as a credit guarantee corporation and I put my business plan on the table, we discuss it together and you see, you see high commercial sensibility in it and you said, okay, I am going to guarantee you. I'm going to stand as your collateral. Now, the same assessment model that you have done on the same project, the bank, my own bank, is also doing that simultaneously. So whatever your judgment, whatever you arrive at, that this project is very strong and it has a, a very uh, significant commercial impact, the banks also arrive at that. Then I will now carry my certificate with the credit guarantee corporation you has given to me. Then I go to the bank, bank and, and the bank says, oh yeah, okay, we are now comfortable. We are at par with the credit guarantee corporation. Your project is commercially sensible. What you don't like, sorry, what you don't have, which is the essence of you going to credit guarantee corporation, is the collateral. Now, the certificate of the guarantee corporation you are holding is your collateral. Your so we are ready to go with you. I mean, it sounds like a very robust suggestion and a robust yes. structure, but it, it is still something we hope will happen now. If we look today, it seems that a lot of companies are also borrowing from each other, especially those who are unable to tap into the banking sector market. Yeah. How big is that informal credit system, if you like? It is too, it's, in fact, the, the non-banking credit exchange is bigger than what you have yeah. in the banking sector. Mm -hmm. For example, the biggest and the most robust in industry we have in this country is oil and gas, followed by communication and then uh, manufacturing is to trying to cash up. Now the exchange of credit, we call that trade credit or business to business credit, credit yeah. is huge. A single contract in the oil and gas, what the operators, the participants in the oil and gas industry, what they do to themselves to be able to get out that oil product. Yeah, such as contractor it, financing. And financing yeah. and, the, and the rest of yeah. it. It's, it's quite huge. Absolutely. So, but I'm glad you're asking that question because so many people in this country had thought that uh, credit is about going to the bank to borrow money. And it is not. Even bankers themselves assume that nobody else knows credit. They hold the whole thing about credit is what they do in the banking sector. Mm. And we say, no, you are just a participant in the entire credit industry. So when we are discussing about credit management, we look at what is happening in your own sector. We look at what's happening in other sectors, yeah. down to the consumer credit. In fact, so we yeah. look forward to see the government of this country um, coming up with that willingness to say, OK, let's get around the table with the expert and discuss how mm. credit guarantee cooperation can be set up. Yeah, and thank you so much. We're going to take a short break. Such a fascinating conversation with great ideas. So we'll take a short break now. And when we return, the discussion around trends and risks for the credit economy with Professor Chris Onalo continues. Stay with us.
You're watching Business Week here on Arise News, and I've been chatting with Professor Chris Onalo, the CEO and Registrar of the National Institute of Credit Administration in Nigeria on the Credit Outlook. So we talked a bit about consumer credit and we looked at the economy. I want to talk about Nigeria, the sovereign. How credit worthy are we, in your opinion? Nigeria is a credit worthy country on many fronts. The first front is Nigeria is the largest country for the black race. And Nigeria is highly populated. Nigeria has very strong, active um, workforce, young people. Uh, Nigeria has uh, its citizens in so many parts of the world who can also, if the right environment is put in place, can bring in massive development. Um, then Nigeria has countless mineral resources. And if you take away oil from Nigeria today, Nigeria will still survive much more than when it was relying on oil. Would we really? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> okay. Gas, agriculture, and the rest of them. And so when you look at this, credit rating methodology recognizes this structure to be able to look at the continuity of the, of, of the country. As you mean, people agree. <clears throat> That's the political side of yeah, it. Yeah, so there's an existential question, es exactly. essentially, yes. as well. Yeah. So Nigeria, as a sovereign state, is a good country. And that is why, in spite of you know, some teaching problems we, we've been having to catch up with development, some marketplaces internationally still see Nigeria as a destination to go. Regardless of international politics, if you go into business discussion with developed economic powers, the Nigeria is still reckoned with. Most people don't know this. But the problem is, how do we put our acts together? Mm. Now, when you are doing a credit rating on Nigeria, that is the first thing that comes to mind. Yes, crisis. No investor is happy to put money down where there are you, 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 there, there's a war, there is an economic crisis, a political crisis, communal crisis. Nobody's interested in that. Yes, Nigeria is not credit worthy when you look at our expenditure profile. Because you have investment, you want to have the returns on those investment. And then what are the things that are likely to affect the investment? You begin to look at Nigeria, you have too much of workforce especially the federal government and the state government. So bloated public bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is, is in there. So Nigeria is, yes, credit worthy. Nigeria is, on one other hand, is not credit worthy. For example, Nigeria could argue, or Nigerians rather, could argue the government who said, we don't want you to borrow money anymore because we don't have good history. Our payment habit is so poor. And when we continue to borrow, then, and without looking at the productive sector of the economy, looking at the mechanism to repay back the loan, then you are mortgaging the future of our children. And they are not likely to survive when you transfer power of leadership you mm -hmm. know, to them. So Nigeria is, uh, on administrative sense, the rating agencies will say Nigeria is not really credit worthy. Okay. So, of course, credit is not just about the ability, but the willingness to pay. And, and that's always been an issue around yes. how we manage our resources. But let's look at the micro level. One of the trends we've seen historically is we're not really a credit card using country yeah. in terms of consumer credit as you have in advanced economies. So people tend to only buy what they're paying for now. Yep. And we're not a credit card focused economy. And sometimes I think the aim for a cashless society and financial inclusion may be at odds yeah. with that. So how do you see that trend panning out? Will that become a trend, people taking more credit cards um, and using that as a spending mechanism going forward? Well, I think the country, as it stands, is looking for investors into that um, you know, consumer credit market. You know, when we talk about consumer credit market, it's not the number of people that buy something that they need for their houses, for their... No, we are looking at the mechanism in place that stimulate possessing interest of the Nigerian people. 
One thing you can quickly use to stimulate that is the issuance of credit card. If you want, if you produce, we are looking for super industrialization for this country. We want to see job created here and there, industries, places of work everywhere, and people are working, no strike, no uh, whatever that stop production process. Nigerians will be very happy to mm. hold a credit card and buy, enter into any shopping mall, supermarket, groceries, and then buy whatever they want against their fixed income that is going to come at the end of the, of the, of the month. That stimulates societal cohesion than when you are to, pay, to buy your things on the basis of the cash that you, you yeah. have. So mm -hmm. Nigeria uh, investors, especially the banking industry, mm -hmm. this is one financial product that they need to introduce. Yes. That apart from cashless, that people who don't want people to carry cash all around, that what is the substitute? We are not even bothered about cash locked in the system, and then we are using a plastic um, you know, mechanism to pull in out the card and pay for what you want. That in itself yes. is good. But what creates more job and creating revenue is credit. It's credit card. Absolutely. You know, Professor Chris Onale, <laughs> we could talk about this more. I do think credit is key for stimulating economic growth and yeah. demand. And yeah. hopefully we'll continue this conversation Thank in the you. future. Thank you so Thank much you for so being much. with you. us. Thank well, you. Thank you. such an interesting discussion there on the credit economy, Professor Chris Onale.